I was invited to deliver the wider annual lecture after I ceased being chairman of the board, which is it should have, as it should have been. Um, and I thought about the theme, uh, I think, for more than three months. Um, I decided on this unusual subject uh, of developing countries in the world economy uh, situated in long-term historical perspective, um, essentially because it was an unexplored domain, it was an untold story, and I had an intuition that the world was changing, uh, that the significance of developing countries in the world economy uh, was undergoing change, uh, but we had not quite uh, comprehended that changing reality. Uh, it was also uh, an experiment, an adventure, uh, about choosing a theme that was different, that was new, um, that did not answer, provide answers, or all the answers, but pose some important questions that people would follow in terms of more research and think about it further. Uh, and I must add that I have, uh, in the past decade, uh, been engaged with economics for much of my lifetime, been working at the intersection of economics and politics, economics and philosophy, economics and history. Huh? And, and this was at the intersection of, econo of, of economics and history uh, that was promising. So as I said, it was uh, an experiment. At the time, after I finished the lecture, I was thinking of ways of how to reduce it to 7,500 words so it would be a paper in a journal. Um, but many people, the feedback on that lecture from across the world, uh, where I traveled uh, through the internet, was enormous, uh, as people downloaded it from the wider website. Um, and uh, people raised questions, some people raised questions, Other asked, others asked, why did I not take it further? Uh, um, some things were left hanging in a tantalizing mode. And a little over two years after I had done the lecture, I decided that it was perhaps worth doing more substantive research on this theme. Um, you know, the intersection of economics and history was an exciting prospect. Um, yet, uh, it seemed uh, more than ambitious to do a book that spanned centuries in time and straddled continents in space to engage with so many debates, contemporary debates in development. Um, I consoled myself with the idea that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Uh, yet on a more serious note, uh, I must say as a scholar, I enjoy sketching the big picture uh, uh, with bold strokes on a wide canvas. Uh, and uh, I could not have thought of a wider canvas. So it is, it is not a book about joining the little dots. It's a book that attempts to, to, to sort the wood from the trees. Uh, and I can only hope, it's not for me to say, it is for readers to judge uh, whether I have succeeded. Mm -hmm. uh, because this book transformed its nature in process, as it were, because when it was commissioned by Oxford University Press, it was meant to be a long scholarly monograph. Uh, and then I was approached by Oxford University Press to consider 
doing what they described as a trade book, shorter at 75,000 words, without copious footnotes, and accessible to the non-specialist reader. On some reflection, I decided it was worth doing. And that is what you have read. The distribution of income and population in the world economy between 1000 AD and 1500 AD um, remained almost unchanged. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that we saw the beginnings of change uh, in the three centuries from 1500 to 1800. Uh, and that was a part of the gradual but discernible economic and social transformation in the West. Uh, uh, it was also a period in which Asia, China and India uh, experienced uh, little change in terms of uh, social and economic organization. Uh, but if we were to single out the most important factors uh, that led to the beginnings of change in these three centuries in the world economy, I would say it was the voyages of discovery and the colonization of the Americas, which essentially came uh, from the search for silver to finance Europe's growing balance of trade deficits with Asia, essentially China and India. But it was also part of a larger process um, where state power and naval power uh, played an important role in, in the evolution of countries. Uh, um, and uh, uh, you had a period when this process was led by the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, um, the voyages of discovery and the colonization of the Americas. Uh, that was followed by a short period with Holland in the lead. Uh, ultimately, uh, England captured that lead. Um, and this mercantilist expansion, uh, state power, naval power, were among the factors, but among, that were responsible for the occurrence of the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, high wages uh, in Britain compared with other countries, uh, the substitution of, of uh, coal for wood, Mm -hmm. uh, the deforestation in England all made a difference. You know? um, but that industrial revolution was to transform the world economy in ways that people living then could not have imagined. That industrial revolution spread from Britain to Europe through the first half of the 19th century, uh, but also coincided with the second phase of colonialism, this time in Asia and Africa. Uh, and what did strike me as uh, something that most people were not conscious of, that even as late as 1820, less than 200 years ago, China and India, two countries in Asia, accounted for 50% of the world's population and 50% of the world's income. The period from 1820 to 1950 saw a dramatic transformation of the world economy, um, which could be most simply described as the rise of the West, Europe, in particular Britain, uh, until about 1870. Uh, and uh, while Britain and Europe continued to prosper, uh, the rise of North America, in particular the United States thereafter. Okay. Uh, but this period was also associated with two other changes. The first has been described by many distinguished economic historians as the Great Divergence, when uh, the gap in 
per capita incomes between the West and the rest widened enormously. So that if we consider uh, 1820, uh, the per capita income of Asia was about half the per capita income of Western Europe and North America. By 1950, the per capita income of Asia was one-tenth that of Western Europe and North America. And if we were to extract China and India from that, then the asymmetries look even starker, the change between 1820 and 1950. Um, the second characteristic or attribute of this change was what I described as the great specialization. Uh, so that uh, you, Western Europe, North America, and then Japan specialized in the production and export of manufactured goods, whereas Latin America, Asia, and Africa specialized in the production and export of primary commodities. Uh, now, uh, this created an international division of labor uh, that perpetuated underdevelopment in what we describe now as the developing world. There is one exception worth noting, that the period from 1870 to 1950 was not one of regress for Latin America. It was for Asia and Africa. For Latin America, its share, both in world population and in world income, increased steadily and in proportion. Now, that was not entirely because of, but it could be attributed at least in part to the fact that independence came to Latin America uh, in the early 19th century, between 1810 and 1820. So they could pursue national development strategies and industrialization strategies with more freedom. Uh, but that, in essence, is what happened. And you know, there was a kind of cum cumulative causation, virtuous circles for Europe, vicious circles for Asia. Uh, and you know, the politics of imperialism imposed free trade on Asia, and the economics of the transport revolution took away the natural protection that was implicit in geographical barriers, in distances, uh, as a consequence of which um, China and India deindustrialized. And slowly but surely, they lost their skills embodied in people, they lost the technological capabilities that were embodied in their economies. And you got the industrialization of Western Europe, and you got the deindustrialization of Asia, two sides of the same coin. This is something that was a, a, a journey in exploration and discovery in terms of research. Uh, I had an intuition that the world had been changing, uh, but it was the research that established for me how much the world has changed. That between 1950 and 2010, the share of Asia, Africa, and Latin America taken together in world population, of course, returned to its 1080 levels that had to do with population expansion and demographic transitions in Europe. But its share in world income rose very significantly uh, from um, less than one fourth in 1950 uh, to almost one half in 2010 in PPP terms. Uh, but it is more appropriate to compare it in terms of uh, at current prices and market exchange rates, uh, where the share went from something like less than ten, less than ten percent uh, to more than thirty percent. Okay, uh, but that was not all. Uh, we also saw in the period from 1970 to 2010 a transformation of the world economy in terms of how manufacturing was distributed across countries in the world. In 1970, uh, developing countries accounted for 8% of world manufacturing value added uh, in constant prices, and this proportion was 33% by 2010. In, in current prices at market exchange rates, this proportion rose 
from 12% in 1970 to 40% in 2010. Um, at the same time, their share in manufactured exports also multiplied by five from 8% to 40%. Now, this was a massive transformation that had gone almost unnoticed. It was, in a sense, an untold story. Yeah? But the divergence in per capita incomes persisted. That gap remained wide. Uh, the, the divergence stopped around 1980, and a very modest convergence began then for a few countries. And in the early 2000s, this was more discernible, but even so, it was concentrated in a few countries, and the income gap between rich and poor countries remained large. Mm -hmm.